Hello and welcome to Good For You. Good for you, man. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you, a podcast about the things we go to, the purchases that haunt us, the best products, services, and industry happenings in the wellness, well-being, and spiritual space. We're going to give you a healthy little dose of fun. We're going to talk about the things that are happening in pop culture, the ones that got away, the things in our cart that are haunting us or ghosting us, our strong opinions that are loosely held. <laughs> we like to call this the Grex. The group text. The group text in your ear. So come say hello. Join us in the audio Grex, where friends don't let friends get, get scammed. scammed. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Wallace. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm today is my official due date. So I'm here waiting and walking and just living, living my life, hoping that this this person makes an appearance soon. He only has two days left of Scorpio season and then <laughs> he's definitely locked into Sag. So we'll see what happens. Have you started thinking about any of the oh all the things to go into into labor like oh yeah I've done like all of them oh really oh yeah I've been like eating dates that's actually evident there's evidence for that love that raspberry leaf tea there's apparently this labor <gasps> salad in LA yes. that you can get in the valley I looked it up it sounds disgusting it's got like gorgonzola cheese on top I'm like mm. no I feel like that's a scam yeah and then acupuncture <laughs> I'm scheduled Ooh. for acupuncture next week if I'm not in labor so yeah, you're supposed to wait a week after your due date, but okay, he'll come when he comes, you know, or or we'll get induced, and that's cool too. Honestly, he's like, don't rush me. Don't take my time. <laughs> exactly. Let me show up fashionably late. I can't be on time for a party. <laughs> I will say he's like astrally projecting into people's dreams because three or four people have been like, your baby was in my dream last night, and I told Ooh. him it was cool to come out, and that it were we're all really fun here, and it's like great. He needs a little. I think he might need some encouragement. Because Donald Trump is running for president. Honestly, <laughs> I would want to stay inside too. It's so cozy in there. You get Safe. free food all the time. I mean, not that he won't get free food. <laughs> Can but... you imagine I just start like a running tab as soon as he's born? <laughs> Honestly, that's that's sometimes how it feels when your parents turn turn into grandparents. They're like, okay, now you owe me. This is part of the deal. You're like, mom, why are you Venmo requesting me? What's going <laughs> yeah. on? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's going to happen. He's going to be perfectly on his own time because they always are especially the first ones they're like you thought you could pin me down <laughs> yeah yeah I'm like is this our first fight I'm trying to get you to be born <laughs> you're refusing and you're winning okay fine that's cool <laughs> but something exciting did happen to me this weekend that has to do with our guest today <gasps> my long last items of clothing my winter items of clothing that were just disappeared out of our basement Guess what? They they did not disappear. They were in the basement. Someone, I won't put I won't name names. Someone did not check thoroughly enough throughout the boxes. And we found all my winter clothes. And I'm so happy. But it does mean that I now have some doubles, Extra. some duplicates <laughs> <laughs> of things that I purchased on Depop that I was like, I need these pants or my favorite pants. And I'm really excited because it means that I don't have to like replace my entire winter wardrobe. But it made me think of our guest today, Amanda from Clothes Horse, because I was like, oh, I'm just so happy to have my clothes back. And we talked all about slow gifting, fashion, resale, clothing rentals, and also like loving fashion and expressing yourself, but <laughs> feeling torn between consumerism and, I don't know, saving the planet. We stopped recording and talked to her for probably another half hour. <laughs> Amanda has a really incredible resume of just work within the fashion industry and a pretty diverse range of work doing merchandising, doing buying at some of the biggest brands in the industry, Urban Outfitters, Mod Cloth, Nasty Gal. And she talks about some of these brands a little indirectly. You can fill in the blanks yourself. It's kind of fun to do that. while you're... <laughs> It's like blind items. <laughs> yeah. We were like, okay, got it. Noted. <laughs> 
And she also recently worked for a huge resale retailer, which we talk about a lot. And rental. They actually do both now. Um, Uh And you have probably, dear listener, been getting ads (laughs) all over TikTok from this rental company, because I know that I have, and they launched their resale platform that looks suspiciously like Depop's resale platform a while ago. We've talked about them on the podcast before. Oh, yes, we have. Yes, we have. Honestly, could not say enough great things about Amanda. She's so smart, but also so funny. (laughs) There's so many jokes that she dropped in there that I only got like 20 seconds later. And it was like an episode of Gilmore Girls. I was like, I need the captions (laughs) on for this. She's so funny. (laughs) And she's also got this incredible podcast. If you haven't heard us talk about it, it's called Clothes Horse. And there's so many amazing resources that she's created for getting into thrifting, an introduction to sustainable fashion. And not only does she share this on the podcast, but she also has some really awesome educational resources for small business owners that will also link. She's just like a a plethora of information. And what I really love about her is, especially in this conversation, I felt so much that she wasn't judging. She's not judgmental and extreme extremist Mm -hmm. (laughs) about sustainability or zero waste. We we briefly touched on that in this conversation about how it can feel so demoralizing, like you're doing it either 100% right or 100% wrong when it, it comes to shopping sustainably and being a more conscious consumer. And I just felt so like warm hearted after talking with her. You know, it made me feel so much better about all the things that we love, you know, beauty and fashion and watching trends and the like joy of consumption while also like wanting to save the planet. So uh, we hope that you enjoy this convo. We do a sexy unique scam. We do. We do a haunted car. We do it all. So without further ado, here's Amanda. Well, Amanda, welcome to Good For You. We're so excited to have you because we're obsessed with your podcast. Yeah, wow. we're <laughs> such fans. Don't say anything nice to me. Oh, right. Sorry. Right, sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> your podcast is kind of okay. Okay, good. No, okay. no, no. I can accept that. <laughs> We actually, Michelle got me onto your podcast and we both have binged it. And when you were like, yeah, I'm down. I was like, what? Cool. I I literally emerged from maternity leave to do this call because I was like, I'm not missing this interview. Basically what happened when I got your email, I I normally like don't respond that fast because I'm like, I have like 70,000 jobs basically, but I was leaving the, it was like a rare few hours where I actually worked at the office and I was about to go to HEB, which is like the grocery store chain here in Texas. And every time I go, it's like an emotional meltdown for me because it's so (laughs) big and everyone is terrible. And it's just, you know, it's a grocery store, right? Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm going to procrastinate on this a little bit longer. So I'm going to just like look at my email really quick. And I saw your message and I was like, huh, they shouted me out. Okay. Like, I hope they weren't too nice about it, but like, I'm just going to take a listen to it. (laughs) And so I listened to your episode while I drove to the grocery store. And I was like, yeah, I think this seems fun. So like, let's see what's going to happen. <laughs> You're like, okay, I'll give them a shot. I'll try them out. <laughs> well, we would love to talk to you about some sexy, unique scams, your slow gifting, haunted cart for this awkward season. To say the least. Yeah. We wanted to start with a good for who. Good for you. Good for you. Good for who. Good for you. You have done such amazing and interesting reporting on the resale business and sustainable fashion for, you know, so long now. How long have you been not only like working in the industry, but also doing kind of your own research into it? Sure. So I have been working in the industry since the early aughts, actually. And in terms of like working on clothes horse in general, that started in 2020 when I was unceremoniously laid off by my employer who was a rental brand. That's why I know a lot about this here. I can't say who they were, but I will just like, as a hint, you did mention their name in the episode where you shouted <laughs> me out. So you, you are aware of this company. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. And- I followed the, the breadcrumbs. I'm glad that we picked yeah. up on it. <laughs> I was laid off like early in the pandemic. Of course, I was one of the original employees. Like I actually onboarded the brands, like helped build out the processes, all of that stuff. And I, I think that ultimately like, I was just a little too good 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're a little, little too yeah. smart for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like laid off, you know, like I'm at that level in my career where there aren't a lot of jobs because I have a lot of experience and right. totally. you know how that is, right? Yeah. Um, as you get to the top of the pyramid of your career, it's like narrower. And they cut off my insurance immediately, which was Ugh. really sick during a Ugh. global pandemic, right? And I definitely had like this 30 day period where all I did was wear pajamas, played the Sims and yeah, me Brad and was just like uh, unconsolable, even though I had to act like, oh, I, mean, I love pandemic. This is great. <laughs> yeah. I, I can do this every day, but I, was inside, I'm like, I am coping like, this. Yeah. Inside. I was like, this is the end of my life. Like what's going to happen? You're and like rosebud, started... rosebud, rosebud. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I mean, I don't know if this happened to any of you, but I got really into Reddit, which is like such mm -hmm. a pandemic thing to do. And I stay I still... being really into Reddit. Yeah, me too. I I'm like in the really Reddit into every day, all day. So it was a, you know, a big lifestyle change for me and people <laughs> were talking a lot about like i remember this was like the early days of the pandemic we were all mad at daniel bernstein which we should be yeah. and i will say that on the record mm -hmm. uh, but people were really confused about her constant collections of clothing and like where they came from and i found myself answering a lot of questions because nobody understands where our clothes come from and i realized wow people think fashion is like really glamorous and amazing and like so important like so much more important than anything else what if they knew that it's like mostly eating sad salads and being depressed? Maybe I should start talking about what the industry is really like. Cause I know all of this stuff and you don't, there are a million podcasts out there about clothes, about fashion, about designers, about so-called sustainable fashion, but nobody really talks about how it works and why it works that way. And so that's how I got started. Do you think it's even possible to have to like, is, is sustainable fashion a misnomer in your opinion? <sighs> I mean, that word is so ruined yeah, I mean, when, when right. people take great words and ruin it. Like, remember how Everlane ruined transparency? And now it's like, oh, oh you mean lying <laughs> yeah. to me? Noted, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's how you feel about a lot of these words. Do I think fashion can be sustainable? 100%. Do I think it can with the model it works on right now? Oh, hell no. And that includes resale and that includes rental is still taking that old narrative of like, you've got to have as much clothing as possible, as often as possible. Don't get attached to it because there's going to be more coming down the pipeline, like bye, bye, bye. And I see that even with a lot of the larger resale platforms where they're like, hey, just as a reminder, there's like this thing you looked at that one time and it's still here and someone offered you a deal or like Poshmark with the weird parties. I don't even understand. Oh, it. my the parties, they, they need to stop ha throwing parties. It feels MLM to me. I don't like yeah. it. I mean, Poshmark has a lot of MLM vibes, right? It's yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, the psychology behind the bidding, I hate how smart it is. Yeah. I have witnessed, I was like, oh, I guess I'm into gambling for clothes. <laughs> <laughs> feeling I understand. I love eBay, for example. Yeah. Like the feeling of somebody accepting your extremely low bid. Oh my God. I, I actually, not too long ago, I had a moment where I had bid, it was something like that was $300. It was a jacket. And I was like, I'll bid 50 bucks. Why not? And they accepted my offer. And I was like, wait, I actually don't want this jacket. This oh, is fucked no. up. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I was like, yeah. this is bad. And I had yeah. to call myself in and I was like, Wallace, what are you doing here? <laughs> or, you know, when I have in the past put in bids of like $5 under, and then someone will be like, how about $31 instead of 30? <laughs> and you're just like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I know. I know. It's so psychological. Right. And I, so yeah. I see this, like, I have only bought one thing from ThreadUp ever because I find that website unbearable and oh, well, aesthetically so pleasing. Ugly. It all regards, right? <laughs> it's unusable. But they are another one who will like constantly harass you. It's oh, like, yeah. hey, just so you know, like there's here's a coupon code or like a thing that you liked or looked at that one time. 17 other people looked at, but none of them bought it either. It's still there. <laughs> like everyone <laughs> thinks it's ugly. But yeah, everyone thinks it's really wrinkly and is wondering why they hung it like that to take right. a picture. Right? right. And so like I just see a lot of those tactics and I see a lot of those tactics in the so-called like sustainable fashion realm as well. And I think it's because a lot of us whether we still work in classic fast fashion or we work in like sustainable fashion, we've learned all those tactics in the same way on the job. And we think that's the only way we can run a business, you know, and that's not true. 
it's true of so many industries. I I feel like the more that I've even learned about the history of like the financial market and how money works, you're like, oh, they haven't invented anything new. Everyone's constantly leveraging debt. Oh, yeah, like what's <laughs> happening in crypto right now. It's like, this is an old story. It's crazy that we haven't learned this. Yeah, yet. it really is. It's like, oh, who could have seen this coming? <laughs> hmm. You know, people ask me all the time, like, is resale better? Like, is buying secondhand better? Yeah, 100% it is. What is not better is continuing to consume it the way we were, like Forever 21 or people are consuming Shein right now. I mean, listen, I there was definitely a period in my life where once a week I would go to Forever 21, I'd drop like 50 bucks and I'd have outfits for the whole weekend. And some of them would disintegrate while I was out <laughs> on the weekend. Magical, right? But you didn't question right. it. And I would just be back and doing that the next week the same way, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how people are shopping secondhand, unfortunately. And I, I think part of it is like we're in that habit and we have to break it. But the other part of it is like these these platforms they are predatory in that way right you know in the episode where you mentioned close horse you talked about the real real and i was like damn girls i have been hearing so many bad stories about the real mm -hmm. real yeah everybody's like don't tell anyone i told you this <laughs> but and it's like everywhere i go <laughs> And it's the same thing. I'm sure it's a toxic work environment. I'm sure people are super stressed out and miserable. Sounds like every fast fashion job I had. Why do you think it's so endemic to the industry? This is something that like, I, I spent a little bit of time working in TV and Hollywood. And I think it depends on who you work with always, what teams you work with. But there is just such an intense, archaic toxicity, male toxicity there that is so pervasive. And I was coming from tech and I was a little bit naive to that toxicity. Why do you think that's true of fashion right now? Maybe it always was. I mean, obviously, I, I don't have any reference before this century. But I remember my first day in the buying office at a pretty like I would say the iconic millennial hipster retailer. It's where I started my career and spent a big time. I love of the it. guessing. Like you really are <laughs> hitting a spot. For us. Scratching an itch. But yes, because when you were like, I started working in the early aughts, I was like, American apparel. <laughs> Yeah. No, not not that one. But we we were worried about them. We had emergency meetings where we had to go like Ooh. design a whole new collection to like compete with American Apparel. I could tell you some Whoa. crazy stories all the time. Anyway, definitely we want uh, to hear them. Major customer overlap though. Got we'll just it. say. So anyway, I, my first day there, my first week there, I'm immediately like, what the fuck have I done with myself? <laughs> like I didn't even know that this was a job that you could have in the first place because I definitely I always thought like I'm gonna be a famous writer. And I'm going to travel all over the world and we have sex with everybody and write books and it's going to be like the best life ever. And then, you know, now I'm working and buying, which is supposed to be the next best thing, I guess. Wait, not being in the fashion industry. I'm like, what does a buyer do? What does your day to day, week to week look like? Great question. Because I, when I interviewed for this role, I said like, what is the job? Because they recruited me. It wasn't like, I was like, I think I'm going to become a buyer. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of things. It's a lot of crisis management. It is a lot of math. It is like I have I could show you I have interesting I have like a very sick ass humongous calculator. It's so cute. <laughs> it's a lot of spreadsheets. It's a lot of critical thinking. So basically, it's like, one, I look at all the data and trends in data in terms of sales. And that can be as granular as like navy blue dresses with pockets sell better that you know, like getting really deep into it. And I use that to sort of architect and make decisions about what I'm going to buy next. I also meet with vendors. I meet with designers. I develop my product myself. So it's like a great balance of both sides of your brain. And it turns out, even though I didn't know what this job was at all when I started, I'm really good at it. But the first week I'm in this buying office, you know, like I have no idea what I have got myself into. And I go to this meeting where the buyers for the apparel, the women's apparel department. So I was working in accessories at that point, which was 50% nicer, we'll say 50% more pleasant. <laughs> they, they are showing, they have like, you know, their samples up on the wall. They're taking terms by category and talking. And the two like senior buyers for this set of apparel categories were making each other cry. Like they were being so nasty in the meeting and one would cry because the other one was so mean. And then like someone had to leave because their face was all red and they were upset. And I was like, why is this happening? And this started this moment for me where I thought, did everybody watch The Devil Wears Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was a documentary or like a, or like yes. a HR training video because that has ha been how it has been in every company I've worked. Now, I always think that of myself as a disruptor in those spaces where I'm like actually a nice 
person. Yeah. Uh, so people <laughs> you're who like, this is me, revolutionary. <laughs> right, right. People who get to be on my team are really lucky. And I build bridges with other people. But man, there are snakes everywhere I've gone. And I don't I don't know what it is. The only place I ever worked where everyone was nice was Mod Cloth. I'll call them out for being a very pleasant team. That's right? so cool. nice. Yeah, really nice. I'm people. also thinking of that show that America Ferrera was in ugly about Betty. Oh, working. Ugly Betty. Ugly Betty. Yeah. Also portrayed fashion as like this toxic, like complex place. But I mean, if you've ever wished that your boss would send you a bikini diet in in email form, sign up for fashion. If you've ever wanted everything about you to be judged every day at work, except for your actual work, sign up for fashion. Like if you've ever wondered, I wish that my success in my career could just be more closely linked to how my eyebrows look. <laughs> oh, sign up for fashion. Right? <laughs> Definitely. If, yeah. If you want to like worry all the time about how you look, what you're wearing, what people think of you, how you smell, what your hands look like, all those things go get into fashion. Oof, ooh, yeah, ooh, it's ooh. rough. I, I don't know why it's like that, but it just is. And I like to think that it will be disrupted over time as younger people get into it. But I don't I don't know about that. Good evening. Tonight's top story. Everything is awful. I mean, as people who we started this podcast being people who are like, oh, we want to be conscious consumers, but we also want to admit that we are interested in fashion and beauty and we are not, you know, completely objecting to participating. We want to do it in, in a way that feels better and that feels for us sustainable, realistic and whatnot. But when a whole industry is so largely based on like appearance, I can see how that superficiality can really become toxic quickly if there are no other like guardrails for people to base their value on. Absolutely. When I was at Nasty Gal, that's kind of like peak fashion industry oh, energy, right? Were you there during like peak? I will just go on the record as saying <laughs> Jezebel did an expose about what it was like to work at Nasty Gal and I was one of the sources. Yes. I remember so. that that because that was a huge contributor. Yeah. That was like 2016, right? Around yeah. that time. Yes. Yeah, like 2015. So I was there as we were like peeking at Girl Boss. All the stories were coming out, and then we yeah. went bankrupt. Right. Oh my god. <laughs> what oh. you were there? Yeah, that, that's why I lost wow. my job there because they ran out of money, and you know they were bought by Boohoo. So right. they became just like even grosser. It was a pretty toxic environment for a multitude of reasons. But something that really struck me there is like they didn't pay us well. I definitely make, would have made easily at least $20,000 more working somewhere else. Yeah, And there were members of my team that I would wonder like, they must have a lot of generational wealth because I can't understand how they're spending like $500 a month on eyelash extensions and this and that. And like they're going shopping on Revolve like every day. That was the other thing is that they all shopped at Revolve, not That's Nasty so Gal. <laughs> There's absolutely those like certain jobs, I think, in the art world, too. People barely make anything for, say, being curators, even at the largest museums until you get to a certain place where you're like, oh, you have to have another source of income, even yeah. though you same thing with journalism. Yeah, totally. there's a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, we we just now like what an amazing group think we're having right now. I think we hit on one of the problems in a lot of these industries, but fashion mm. being a great example, is that you don't really get a diverse range of people working in that industry from a socioeconomic perspective, certainly from a racial perspective, certainly from even just like a body type perspective. And so it gets, it, it it's like so, it just gets ugly in that way because these people are just like, it's like a feedback loop of- 100%. Privilege, basically. And then it just gets gross. Yeah. Oof. So when you were working for the resale company at the time, did you believe, oh, this is really going to be amazing in terms of what this idea of resale is going to do for the industry? Of course I was. So previous to taking that job, I was living in Portland, Oregon, where I had about a year previous left probably the most toxic job I've ever had, which was this like so-called like feminist retailer. They're still in business. They're based in Portland, Oregon. Oh, and I know they are. <laughs> the name. So I was the director of merchandising there. Obviously, anybody who really wants to know where I worked, you can find me on LinkedIn. I mean, like, that's right, right. How it works, right? <laughs> Kudos to you for Googling. Our you know? ghouls are they really are. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. So yeah. this that job was, I was director of merchandising there. I definitely created the 
all of their own private label product. Like they didn't sell that before. Wow. Put a lot of great things into play, but that job was so toxic, so cruel. It made me sick. And after that, oh I was like, I, I'm, I'm not going to work for anyone else ever again. And so I started just, you know, seeing clients and I was working on all these really amazing products, projects with smaller businesses that were focused on sustainability and like true sustainability before it became like a marketing yeah. message. And also mm -hmm. just like women owned businesses. This was what was really important to me. And I was like, I love this. I'm never working for anyone else ever again. So ding dong. That's not a phone ringing. That's a doorbell. <laughs> okay, whatever. They're like, hi, we you used to work for our company before. And we know you're an amazing cultural fit. And you have all this experience. And we would love for you to come back and help us launch this new sustainable thing we're doing. And I was like, uh, I know having worked for you, I'm like very skeptical of this. And they were like, no, seriously, just sign this NTA. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to tell you all about it. And I'm like, okay, fine. I need to know, right? Let's see what happens here. Right. And so I, you know, hear the story, which is like, we are launching a rental platform. We will also be adding resale in the future. We've got a lot of big ideas here. This is going to be a major shift for us and like doing better things for the planet and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and I, I was kind of like, okay, like, well, how much money would you pay me? Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, my insurance is really expensive right now. Yeah. I'll, I'll interview. Let's just see what happens. So, you know, of course, it's like a flurry of interviews. If you've ever had to go through these kinds of process, you're like, how many interviews deep am I on this <laughs> job? So anyway, then they're like, okay, we want to fly you to city on the East Coast where our headquarters is and have you interview with a bunch more people. And I'm like, well, guys, I actually am leaving for Japan in three days. I'm going to be gone for two weeks. So can we do it after that? And they're like, no, you have to come right away. Listen, here's what we're going to do. You're leaving for Japan on Tuesday. We're going to fly you in on Sunday night. You're going to interview all day on Monday, fly home. You get to go home for a few hours and then you can go back to the airport and be on a plane for like 20 hours. And Whoa. I, for some reason, I have a really hard time saying no to people. I said, mm -hmm. yeah, that seems cool. I'll do that. I go <laughs> out there. I have like a horrible time interviewing Ugh. there. I'm like, I'm having PTSD from when I worked on this campus before. I like remember how toxic it is here. I get on the plane. I go home. My husband and I are boarding the flight to Japan the next day. And I turned to him and I'm like, I'm not going to take that job. And he's like, cool. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> I don't know what happens, but they ghosted me for a month. And in that month, when they finally called me back and wanted to make an offer and offered me money, I said yes. So we moved to the East Coast. You had to find out. You know, and they offered me a pretty decent package. So yeah. I get there and I am excited. I am excited to do this new thing because I've seen how damaging yeah. clothing is to the world, right? I love this idea of people wearing stuff over and over again, but ultimately it just, it, it wasn't that most of the stuff we bought was fast fashion. In fact, 50% of our assortment came from our sister brands, which were all very low quality. We saw some stuff, only, not even some, a lot of stuff only being worn one time before it had to be damaged out. We really were selling on this idea that you need to wear a new outfit every day, which I don't like. Of course, people could buy things that came in their boxes. And when I was still there, that's when we were starting to launch the resale concept and build it out. And I was brought into all those meetings as basically the only person there who had ever thrifted before or bought something secondhand. So being like the, the person in the room. And so we were working on that when I got laid off. But when I saw it launch during... I don't know, like last year, their resale option. I was like, this makes me so angry just because I I think, and that's with a lot of these platforms, Poshmark, Depop, et cetera. Like I'm glad that they're there because they give people an opportunity to shop secondhand more easily, people to make a little bit extra money, you know, flip their wardrobe, whatever. But ultimately all of these platforms, including the one that I was working for, these companies benefit financially from doing very little for the people who sell on their platforms and they make it harder for those people to make a living selling on their platforms, right? Because they like they're like free shipping, free shipping, or offer these low ball, low ball deals, take them, take them, take them. And there's so much pressure there. And they keep raising their fees. And I know that fees on the platform for the company I was working for are pretty high based on some conversations I've had with people. And I don't know, when I look at a big fast fashion company like that getting into rental and resale, to me, it's just incredibly insincere. And what they're really saying is, shit, we need to like make more money now. We need to have that exponential growth for the rest of time. And so we're going to do it in every way, but we're not going to think about what's right for the planet or the people while we're doing it. It's just about like, it's a gimmick. It's a marketing story.
I don't know if you saw this, Amanda, but ThreadUp just announced another resale as a service program. I guess they're doing this with quite a few different brands and the most recent one is Hot Topic. <laughs> it's just like, no, that's not getting, even... yeah, it's yeah. not going to last. <laughs> I know. I mean, I like, well, you saw Zara is like, now we're doing resale and Shein yeah. and I'm like, guys, guys, can we talk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, is the logic behind that, that they want to just control the secondhand market and pricing basically there and take a cut of secondhand? I mean, think about it. They get a cut, a big cut, when they sell you the thing in the first right. place. Then they get to keep their hands in your pockets and take yeah. another cut when you sell it to someone else, right? And that's that's because they've hit a wall in terms of how much this industry can grow. Right, exactly. And it's all based on exponential growth, to your point, totally. which is think, impossible. I think we're getting sick of it, right? We're like, uh, like... I'm over it. I don't want to go shopping on Zara anymore. So Zara's like, oh man, like we've hit peak customers. Better start selling secondhand. The fact that Hot Topic is doing that is so bizarre <laughs> to me. But I'm sure someone thought it was also a good marketing story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The thing yeah. that I think is interesting or I hope will happen and I wonder if it will or how long it will take in terms of a cultural shift is not wanting to even look the same as everybody else. And having you had a really awesome series of personal audio essays in your most recent episode. And I love I don't remember which guest, but she was talking about I think she was the one who does a lot of dead stock clothing making with jeans and stuff. And she was like, doesn't everyone want to unique? Why do we all want to look the same anyways? Why is that still something that we're so conditioned to do? What happened to being unique with your style as well? And I'm wondering when that shift will happen too for this market, but maybe not. I mean, I hope it will, right? I think that it can be frightening to be the first person in your social circle who wears what you want. But over time, I mean, as the person, like, and when I was in high school, everybody called me Punky Brewster, which was a deep <laughs> cut. Like, kudos to the person who remembered that character because I wore, you know, like what they thought of as like crazy clothes. And Definitely when I was like 14, it hurt my feelings. Although like Punky Brewster is really cute. So Punky cute. Right so cute. Yeah. <laughs> Very Gen Z, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So Gen Z. But at the time I was like, man, people are really like hurting my feelings. And over time you kind of like grow a thick skin. Like now if someone comes up to me and says, hey, it's not Halloween. I'm like, wow, are you in love with me? <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Best compliment ever. But I do think one reason that I am never going to be on social media or on my podcast being like, you're all doing it wrong and there's only one right way and you need to just do what I say or you're a monster and you're ruining the world is because what we wear, what we buy, the world that we live in is so complicated and like stuff is so deeply entangled in our psyche and how we feel about ourselves and the people around us and how they feel about us that like these decisions are not easy. And I, anyone who's like, you know what you need to do is just stop buying clothes altogether or get yourself some hemp tunics and call it a day. <laughs> like, that is just not going to work. Yeah. Right. No. And all we do is we put people off of doing living life in a better way, right? Because we're being jerks. So that is a line that I walk constantly. And I do feel like I have made personally a lot of progress in that over the past couple of years and like refining that message and being more welcoming. And I really just try to lead by example to everybody else out there who's curious about living a more sustainable lifestyle, that there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. And you're not a bad person if you bought a bra from Target. Like it happens. Yeah, it can feel so all or nothing. I, I was zero waste for 10 months a couple of years ago where I didn't make any trash. And I was telling Wells before we got on this call, you know, I went like from one extreme to another because I was like recycling. They don't even recycle in LA. Like, you know, when I learned about everything, I, I was know. just like, oh my God, what's the point uh, of any of this? Yeah, you know, I hear you. I it can hear be you. demoralizing. And I think that that's a lot of people's journey, especially like, I don't know, just the puritanical nature of the United States and like good versus evil, being bad, being good, that uh, ethics and more totally. like quote unquote morality that's rolled up into sustainability culture. Like it is really complicated. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it is really complicated. And I know people want easy answers. Like I get a lot of messages. Mm -hmm. They're like, where should I buy a bathing suit? What should I do here? Yeah. <laughs> is this place good or bad? And I'm like, every time I'm like, well, <laughs> it's complicated. That's the way it is. Do I think that like resale is a scam? 
I don't think that shopping secondhand is a scam. I think it's incredible. I do think the resale industry is a scam. Okay. There you go. Because I think it scams the sellers yes. and it pushes customers into like crazy gambling for clothes behavior yeah. and buy, 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 buy. And if you don't think that there is an environmental cost of all that shipping and packaging. Right. It, yeah. Out of your mind. It's a lot. Same thing with yeah. rental. Same yeah. thing with rental. Yeah. So, okay. So rental scam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Total scam. I mean, here's what I would say. You, I think you can use rental in a smart way. Like if you're like, okay, I yeah, have to yeah. go to 17 weddings this summer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Rent stuff to wear to that. Fine. But unfortunately, like every other industry, rental is like, oh man, like we got to keep growing every year. We already cornered the special occasion market. And I even saw this happen with Rent the Runway. Like we should start renting out sweatpants and everyday clothes now. And right. I started seeing like athleisure on Rent the Runway. That's no. gross. Yeah, no. Like I don't really want to wear yeah. <laughs> yeah, clothes, no thanks. Know? My boss at the rental company I worked for was obsessed with us bringing in swim. No. <laughs> and I was like, we did a search. I was like, I don't. That's a little too She's close. Like, you would buy a secondhand bathing suit. And I'm like, sure, but renting it and like what if it didn't get washed right it's just i don't feel good about it and we did a survey and everybody else on the entire team was like no yeah she's like okay hear me out lingerie yeah she's like what about if it's just thongs butt plugs just butt plugs and thongs uh, that's it we're you know no bras yeah that's it i mean hey people want to try sex toys before yeah. they buy them I mean, I think that they would be cleaner, you know? <laughs> yeah, I bet. That's true. <laughs> I bet. Well, I thought the biggest, probably best drag to Rent the Runway was when that article came out being like, Rent the Runway is basically a large dry cleaning service. Oh my, yeah. Totally. And it is like horrifying, but a great reminder of just how wasteful it is. <laughs> it is so wasteful. And I know that they don't have that unlimited plan anymore. Yeah. But when I was first working with the rental company that laid me off later, we spent about six months just researching, doing a lot of like competitive shopping as we were building things out. And I remember there was this article that came out and I still have not been able to find it so that I can include it anywhere on social media, which is really frustrating. But we all passed it about the around the office for like weeks. I swear it was in the New York Times. It may not have been, but it was about Rent the Runway and the weird behaviors that people were getting into with it. And, yes. you know, it was like, I need to wear as many outfits as possible. Like if I'm paying, I don't know how much was Rent the Runway, like $100 yeah. a month. I need to have 30 outfits this month. And so there was this one woman who, so she's like, oh, there's a drop off location downtown mm -hmm. and so what i've been doing because i go down there every day now to swap clothes which is it was in new york right in new york yeah and she's like so i've been rekindling relationships with people who live down there just to make it more convenient with me and i was like all so you can have 30 oh my outfits God. in a that month unhinged. yeah <laughs> i hope that she sent this out to everyone was like oh my god guys i'm in the new york times <laughs> and people read that and would like consider this relationship right everyone who lives under 14th yeah. street is like what the fuck <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine saying that to the New York Times. I was like, she's just high on dry cleaning fumes, right? That's what it is. <laughs> that is a like addiction in full force. Yeah. And that's unfortunately what rental feeds into. Like even in the rental service I was working for, you would get a box of like six items every month. But we had a lot of people who subscribed to two or three boxes. What? Because Whoa. that wasn't enough. And then we added a feature where if you were over it already, you could pay an additional fee and get another one. Right? Like right. send it all back and get it. And like people were signing up right and left because we were saying like, you need a new outfit every day. And that is a really unhealthy mindset to be in. Yeah. And I can say as a person who worked in fashion for my career, that is what it felt like for me every day I went to work. Like mm -hmm. I needed a new outfit every day. And that is like, if rental goes away, right? How are you going to keep that habit going? You've got to break it. It's so bad. I probably have like seven houses right now <laughs> if I hadn't worked in fashion and felt like I needed <laughs> yeah. new clothes every yeah. day. And it's interesting to think about these behaviors. I feel like this is the conversation too around social media apps when so much is playing on our basic instincts. All of this stuff is designed with our mammal brains in mind <laughs> where we're like simple on some level because we just have these desires and these needs that are very easily exploited. And yeah. how do we change these habits on our own? It feels so heavy as an individual's responsibility. I know that's not what you're saying either, but it's it's something that I think about so often is, yes, there's things we can do as communities, you know, the ripple out effect of getting your friends more into vintage or resale if there is any good resale. <laughs> I just, I think about this a lot of what is that shift 
this is something that I have been dealing with since I started Close Horse. Like in the beginning, people would comment on things I posted and say like, you're wrong. The real thing that needs to happen is that we need to like, Amazon needs to fix what they're doing and then the world will be better. Like my impact is never going to be as significant as Amazon. And unfortunately, the bad news for everyone is that we all need to work on ourselves and change and we need to support one another in those changes and make this huge societal shift because when people want to be like, Amazon ruined my life, ruined the world. I'm like, here's the deal. We all made Amazon. What it is <laughs> yep, right now. We bought it. We drank yes, the Kool-Aid, right? my friends. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like when in the early aughts, like the, the most embarrassing place you could ever shop if you were like remotely progressive or liberal was Walmart. Right. And it was like, if, I remember having to go to Walmart and like hide it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, guys, I was at a museum. <laughs> yeah. My mom f- like forbade me from ever going to a Walmart. And when they opened their first location in Canada, she was like ruining the day. It was something that was so important to her s- symbolically. And I was like, but you'll shop at Target. Okay. Right, I know it's the same thing, right? Just different yeah. wrapping. But, you know, Walmart literally did swoop in and destroy many small businesses, downtowns of little towns. And then after yeah. that was done, they would pull up their stakes sometimes and move somewhere else. And then an even more yeah. predatory company like the Dollar General would move in there, right? right? And everybody was like, I can't believe Walmart's doing this. And I'm like, no. Walmart is doing it, but that's because everybody went and shopped there. They stopped yeah. shopping at the small businesses. They stopped shopping in downtown. Whatever reason, Walmart was cheaper. It had more stuff. It was one location. It took less time. I mean, there's a million reasons why, right? It's the same thing with Amazon. Oh my God, I can get anything that exists in the world at my house in two days or less. I'm going for it, you know? And we need to break that habit in order for Amazon to stop being Amazon. As yeah. long as we're still shopping there and saying, well, it's not my fault that Amazon's so big. It's going to keep being big, right? Mm-hmm. And when it comes to like Shein and Zara and H&M and all the other fast fashion brands out there, they're never going to change until we stop shopping with them and then yeah. they'll be forced to. And I can say that as a person who's worked in this industry for a long time. Yeah. We At Nasty Gal, for example, I kept saying, hey, We need festival clothing. Coachella is like Christmas for our customer. And our CEO, this was after Sophia stepped down Mm -hmm. as CEO and we brought in someone else, was like, festival is embarrassing. We are not selling festival clothes. Okay. When did Nasty Al get such a high bar? Yeah. (laughs) I can tell you stories all day about how we were like, we're going to be the Barneys for millennials. R.I.P. Barneys. Seriously. (laughs) Seems like that was a great business concept. (laughs) Anyway, so people kept asking for festival clothes. We saw that in the spring, we'd actually take a dip in sales because you know what? People were buying all their festival clothes somewhere else. And so it was like, oh shit, we got to carry festival. Mm -hmm. And then we did, and we made lots of money. I mean, relative and still went out of business, but you know, it was like a big deal. And I've seen this in everything, whether it's like, should we buy this t-shirt in black or blue? It's like, oh, well, black do you sell best. Great. Okay. We're going to do black to larger stories like this. I mean, you mentioned American apparel when we first started talking and like the company I worked for was scared shitless of American apparel. It was so extreme that we did a floor set where we painted everything like enamel white and used neon tape on the walls to make people feel like they were at American what? apparel. Bad wow. idea. Very bad idea. <laughs> now Los Angeles apparel. <laughs> Don't get me started. Burn it. I always think about this quote in in many different areas of my life, but I feel like it applies so much to Amazon and fast fashion and just what we're like the climate crisis in general is don't sacrifice what you want most for what you want now. I love that. It just cuts through all the bullshit because if what we want most is clean drinking water and a planet. You know, a planet. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Not just water. And if what we want most is to actually support independent retailers and independent businesses and small businesses, it's like, okay, so if I want to, yes, get all my holiday shopping, for example, done in one weekend, does that align with what I want most is to support all indie businesses for every gift that I'm giving giving this year. If I can do that in one weekend, amazing. But if not, I'm going to try and find an alternative so that I can try and live up to like what I want most. But it's hard because it's all about the convenience. I think we're just a culture of convenience now. Yeah. I mean, someone said this to me a few months ago and it's just stuck with me, which is convenience is not a human right. Ooh. And I have That's seen, good. Right. 
I have seen things become more convenient in my lifetime already. I'm sure like people who are older than us are like, oh my God, that, you know, like the classic, like, well, when I was your age, I had to walk through the snow to school or whatever. I think people still do that. They probably don't. Anyway, uh, <laughs> like I was even thinking like, oh, when I was in school and you had to do like a paper and you would have to go to the library and like pull out the card catalog and then like find the card and then go like write it down and then go find it. Like, wow, inconvenient, yeah. right? <laughs> Was it though? You know, and I think like that, like I never was like, wow, this is so inconvenient. <laughs> I, this is, There's like, got to be a side. better way to do it. We're excited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I think about that a lot that like what we think of is inconvenient, like having to like go somewhere and do your shopping or spend a little bit more time on it or wait longer for it to arrive or pay for shipping. All these things that we see as like massively inconvenient and like decision makers for us. Are they though? Mm -hmm. yeah you know just like take a step back you know Amen. i was talking about this with my therapist recently and how i, I was like i actually mm -hmm. just like really like walking around and having to go to different stores sometimes and it taking a long time yeah like it is annoying but then it does kind of like calm me down and i just like need that time by myself yeah. and he was like totally yeah. <laughs> That's called being a person. Yeah, I don't mind it either. <laughs> you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, I tried Instacart like everyone else. And at first, the first time it was fun. Like it was almost like playing a game, like ordering yeah. all the yes. stuff. And then yeah. it arrived, and it was a nightmare. I ended up with like 10 bags of frozen green beans <laughs> because every time a vegetable, like a fresh vegetable wasn't available, the shopper put in another bag of frozen green beans, which by the way, frozen green beans are not very no. good. I could have made something <laughs> with some frozen peas, but I think I ended up like cooking them on some soup that we all felt sad about but we were like this is the pandemic this is how we live now it's unhappy okay just eat this yeah, soup. <laughs> yeah it's um, very sad. <laughs> right? but then i realized i was like you know what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna put on a mask and gloves because this is the gloves era TBT. of the pandemic yeah right? and i'm gonna yeah. go buy this stuff myself because going out and doing something that feels kind of normal is help is it's good for me and i enjoy the process of picking food myself and i say the same thing with just about everything like shopping wise i would much rather go buy it irl um, unless it's something really annoying like a vacuum cleaner i probably don't want to do that i never want to go to the apple store ever <laughs> uh, oh no need right no need. but like otherwise i think we think that it's the, in our best interest to just order it all online and wait for the packages but i actually think mentally it's better for us to get out there. Yeah. Interact with people yeah. in, first of all, especially your community, if you're trying to shop more locally. And I don't know about you, but I cannot be trusted to know the amount of mushrooms I need in pounds. <laughs> no. I always order it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and then exactly. I'm like, okay, so mushroom <laughs> soup it is for a week. Yeah. And I think that's true also of so many products you get. It's so hard to understand what it's going to feel like, look mm -hmm. like, what, yeah, what it's going to feel like to hold and to interact with the object and the people who made it. You don't get that online in the same way. We had these wonderful guests on last week on the podcast, two founders of the Goodbye app. And I think what they're doing is really interesting in terms of trying to intercept our habits of shopping with mm -hmm. introducing you to new independent sellers, which is incredible. But I think there's a return to in-person shopping in general Oh, I think for so all of too. these reasons. Yeah. And honestly, it's probably not that I'm like, guys, we really need to get together and save retail or anything like that <laughs> yeah. but even like oh my god what's gonna happen to forever 21 <laughs> nothing like that but i do think it's probably in the best interest of like retail and businesses as a whole to get people back to online shopping because like the return rate on things bought online is crazy like 30 percent. if 30 percent of the stuff you sell online is returned you're like oh things are going well your business is fake you know yeah like that's not a good business a 30 percent return rate no no there's this place so i live in austin texas and there's a place up north that dustin and i happen dustin's my husband we happened upon i can't remember how but it's a place that buys pallets of returns from amazon oh my God. and it's called bin drop and they dump them into bins and then like on saturdays everything's nine dollars and sundays everything's eight dollars and we actually found it was a really great place to go get n95 masks oh. so we started going there every couple of months and stocking up on like a shit ton of masks oh. and it's really interesting to see what's in those bins like it upsets me yeah. but it also tells me a lot about consumer behavior for sure and how what's people... in the bins oh my god so many <laughs> like electronic you tchotchkes uh -huh. of cords and chargers oh, yeah. and 
phone cases and, you know, all of those things that are, we think of as like temporary things that actually are going to be on the planet, like way longer than anything we know. Lots of that, lots of really failed home decor purchases, which does not surprise me, right? Throw pillows, candles. I personally cannot buy something if I cannot smell it. Sorry. Oh, like, yeah. Of course you're returning yeah, that. It's really cool. hard. Five Cold piece uh, potpourri burner set. You know, like there just lots of stuff like that. Lots of baby stuff, actually. And it seems like it's often because they buy the wrong. You know, I think like so much baby stuff is so modular now. So if you use bottles, if you don't have all the right pieces, right? Like lots of stuff like that. Just so much. It's not, there's no clothing. It's all just Amazon stuff. Amazon basics. Yeah, a lot to Amazon's basics. Oh my God. If you ever want some packing cubes, get on over oh to gosh. Binge Rock. <laughs> this is like, it's really crazy. And it, it, it makes me angry, right? I'm glad that this yeah. business exists where people come in and buy these things. But to me, it underscores the fatal flaw. And I mean, fatal literally of big e commerce like this in that people buy more than they need and then they hate it. And then it goes nowhere. You know, I have noticed that like some companies like Target are now like, hey, just keep it. We'll give you your money back for the thing oh, you want to return. Amazon does that sometimes too, depending on what it is. <sighs> just like passing the burden on to yeah. you. This makes me think of also holiday presents and Christmas presents and how I don't want more stuff. Like, please don't give me stuff, especially that I haven't asked for that I don't need. Uh, <laughs> totally. But you're all about slow gifting. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? I will tell you that slow gifting was born from having to work in the retail industry <laughs> my whole adult life and see so much of this stuff being bought that no one actually wanted oh my god yeah january is just return return everything it's all returns Uh, all month right brutal right and you have to remember that there are plenty of people who are like i don't i'm too lazy to return right so then that stuff sits in their garage their storage room their closet whatever until someday they pass it off to the goodwill or sell it at a yard sale and i remember like Before I moved into buying, I actually worked retail for that same company. Like I worked in the store and when holiday came, we would sell like the incredible volume of really dumb stuff we were selling. We had these humping dogs. No, like (laughs) people would call and be like, Hey, do you have the humping dog back in stock? And I would be like, you're a monster. (laughs) I didn't say that, but I thought it like nobody wants this for more than five minutes. I am judging you. (laughs) <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm judging you. Get your friend. You know what? If you really need to get someone something, just give them a gift certificate. They yeah. don't want this. Or like world's most humongous wine glass that's like the size of your head. Nobody's really going to use that more than right. once. Bacon band-aids. At least those are kind of useful, right? Sort of. But it was just like tons of stuff like that. And like just people just buying like boatloads of it. And as I were, moved into buying, you know, my job was to come up with like what else we could get people to buy as a gift that maybe they didn't plan on buying but it was like oh i'll get to the free shipping threshold if i add one more thing everywhere i've worked we have engineered that free shipping threshold to force you to buy one more thing it is not a coincidence okay so after seeing all of that after going thrifting my entire life and seeing all of this stuff ending up there a few years later like there was a time where everybody was buying these weird cupcake makers that were basically like a panini thing i think but made cupcakes or something and i see them like at every thrift store now uh like that kind of like cycle it's like when the jesus toast stamp or whatever Uh, totally we spelled that where i went (laughs) yeah so you know just like seeing all of that play out in front of my eyes and also in the past few years having conversations with people in my life about how i just like don't want Mm -hmm. gifts like rando gifts and like in a nice way just being like let's just not give each other gifts yeah like I will tell you the first person I had a conversation with about that was related to me, is related. We're still related. We didn't like <laughs> one another. And she like loves Christmas, like saves for it all year mm. and wants to get everybody to give everybody yeah. gifts. And I was like, I just, I can't do it anymore. I have to buy you a gift and your partner a gift. Then mm-hmm. I have to buy you both a gift from my husband as well. <laughs> when I told her about this, she was basically like, I think you're like a damaged bad person. <laughs> She's like, you oh killed gosh. Christmas. <laughs> you- yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hate a good time. You're so miserable, blah, blah, blah. Right. And I was just like, no, I just like, I would rather you take that money and go out to dinner yeah. or go yeah. on a trip. Do you think some people take it offensively because it's their love language? 
I think there are a few things there. Some people giving gifts is their love language. And to be fair, I love giving people gifts. I travel a lot for work. So every time I go on a trip, like a 1950s, like businessman husband, I always bring <laughs> gifts back from my husband. I'm from oh my there. God, so you know? cute. Uh, and I love that, right? I love being like, oh, that's the perfect thing that he's never seen before. So that's one of the reasons people will give you pushback. And other people, other times people are like, what, you think I can't like get you a good gift? <laughs> They see it as a competition. They're like, okay, noted. I'm going to get you the best gift. (laughs) Or they're like, oh, you think I can't afford to get you a gift? Uh And so I think it's just always really great to just be really clear and transparent. Even if the reason you don't want to give gifts is because you don't have the money, like no one's going to hold that against you or be like, if they love you, they're not going to be like, oh God, you know who is such a failure? (laughs) that one over there. No one's going to do right. that. Right. No. And I think just being like, I have too much stuff. It gives me anxiety or I hate gift shopping and I don't want to be in the position where you got me a gift and I didn't get you one. Cause I hate that. And I want you to feel good. And I would just rather like you use your money to make yourself happy. You know, I'm, I'm here to spend time with you. We could do something special together if you would like to do that instead. In lieu of gifts, I think there are a lot of other ways to have that conversation. You can also say like, yeah, we're giving each other gifts. That's cool too, mm-hmm. right? But we're going to we're going to ask each other for a list and get each other what we want, not something that we saw that we could add to cart to get free shipping or buy the checkout at totally. Sephora or wherever else, right? And I think that saying like we're going to change the way we gift isn't saying like, oh, this is like the war on Christmas, <laughs> right? This is not okay. <laughs> this is not the cups at Starbucks. This is like saying like ostensibly, I mean, I don't remember this time because in my life, it has always been about gifts, forced time with people you don't like, <laughs> eating lots of food and people fighting, right? That's yes. my family. Lots of um, that. Right. And awkward interactions as a whole. <laughs> but I know I hear rumors that in the days of yore, people celebrated holidays together to spend time together and build memories and play games and make crafts and cook together. Let's bring that back. If I if know. it ever was, I think it was yeah. right. Yeah, I I read all those Laura Ingalls Wilder books when I was a kid, <laughs> and they were always like getting like one candy stick and an orange and like hugging each other. That sounds great. <laughs> Someone might be going blind this Christmas, but they time. were happy about it. You know, they were happy <laughs> and they loved each other. <laughs> now, does everyone have their presents? Yes, Miss Beagle. Merry, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas, Miss Beagle. It's so true about setting the expectations too. I have two older brothers and we don't have a big family, but when we were doing the holidays together, we decided, okay, we'll do a secret Santa. So everyone just has to get one thing for Mm -hmm. these 10 people. And that was nice. And I think that also just reframed our relationship around gifting. It really reduced expectation. Everyone felt more relaxed in general. And that wasn't the focus anymore. It was really nice to have that shift. I love that because, you know, we talk about, I mean, I don't know. I remember my hearing my grandma say this when I was a kid, even like, oh, I don't want to go to the mall right now. Everyone's yeah. driving crazy and they're so rude and blah, blah, blah. And it is true as a person who's worked retail and also lived in this world <laughs> that there is something about the last two months of the year that turns everybody into just like the worst version of themselves. They're like all in yes. or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I believe that a big chunk of that is the stress around gifts. It's the procuring of the gifts. It's mm-hmm. the going to get them and dealing with other people. It's the financial side of it. I mean, people mm-hmm. go into ridiculous amounts of debt to give gifts that maybe, I mean, how sad is that to give someone something that you is on your credit card and you're not going to pay off until next year. And it wasn't even something that they wanted and they're going to put it in their closet or return it. I hate that. So true. So is for you, slow gifting, basically being like no gifting unless you see something throughout the year or is it like around the holidays specifically or well, we give gifts all year, right? I mean, yeah. there's birthdays and baby showers and weddings and stuff. And I think taking that slow gifting mindset into all of it is really important. So slow gifting isn't like no gifts because that's like diet culture right there. Like I'm going to put you on a gift diet. You're going to fail, right? You're going to like binge gifts later, yeah. <laughs> right? and then hate yourself. I have done that to myself. <laughs> right. And my family has done that 100%. We've all been through that. Totally. So that is... 
no gifts can be a boundary that you set as part of slow gifting. It can be that you make all your gifts. It can be that you give secondhand gifts, which is what my family and I do. It can be that you don't give things, you gift experiences to people. But most importantly, no matter what it is that you choose to gift or not gift, you are giving people what they want. So like I had definitely had people in my life who for reasons that I can't understand, but I respect are not going to be totally cool with like a secondhand gift or they just want money or they would rather have a gift certificate to Chili's. And I'm just going to do yeah. that because that's, what's going to make them happy. I'm not going to force them to be like, I'm going to be like, guys, Chili's is so inauthentic. <laughs> I'm going to get you this gift card. <laughs> this really artisanal <laughs> local Mexican restaurant and you're going to go eat it. And that's that I'm going to say like, okay, Chili's this is your favorite restaurant. I'm heading over to Chili's to get you a gift card. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's, what's really important is giving people what they actually want, not what is convenient, something that we scrambled to find something that is just available, but actually saying like, I'm going to put in the work. So like this year, for example, my husband and I are not giving one another gifts. We're going to Japan. We were like, You're going back. we'll just go to Japan, MBZ, yeah. right? That'll yeah. be our gift. <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in the past, like during the pandemic, we couldn't like travel, obviously. And so we did a lot of like really cool secondhand gifts that took us like all year to procure, you know, and we do that the same thing with like our closest loved ones. But if my husband was like, I hate Japan, we wouldn't do that, right? We'd go to Chili's if that's what mm -hmm. he wants. And I think that's just what's really important is paying attention to people, literally asking them what they want. And then getting yep. that and use a registry if someone has it. God. Oh, I'm so angry when people shop off registry. Absolutely. What? <laughs> yes. it, it is this kind of audacious thing. My mom has this where she has to get you a surprise. But 99% of the time, we all don't like it. Like, she, I love oh, her. But it she's... makes me so sad. But I know it. Yeah. And yes. it's it's so sweet and endearing, but it's so wasteful in the end and so sad for everyone, especially when the other person doesn't like it. Yeah, it's terrible. And why should gifting be traumatic? We need to end that. <laughs> Amen. It's supposed to be fun. I like the slow gifting. It's very honest and direct and clear. I just, so much of our, our of what we do, especially around consumer behavior, is built on artifice. Mm -hmm. And I think the best gift we can give to ourselves and everyone around us is to be true to what we want, who we are, what we want to wear, where we want to shop, all of those things. So in a way, this is sort of a callback to our days when we believed in Santa and we would write a list and we'd be like, this is what I want. <laughs> yeah. I want a Polly Pocket and I want some glittery jeans from Luna too. <laughs> That's what you we want. Gotta, we got to right? go back I to mean, that. Totally. Kids will betray you because they'll be like, oh my God, I really want these glittery jeans from <laughs> Limited 2. And then you get them and then they never wear them <laughs> once. Or like, I have, I've been collecting stories from everybody who are like, I asked for an American Girl doll 17 times and I finally got it and I never played with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or I cut all her hair off immediately and put out cigarettes on her. It was terrible. I, no, no, no. That. Everyone cut yeah. the hair. Like, oh, and, everyone yeah. cut the hair. Yeah. Everyone cut the hair. But I mean, it is true. Like, just tell people what you want. And yeah, like maybe they will get you an American American girl doll like you asked for and you will cut the hair but whatever that's what you wanted and you, you wanted, wanted that experience and why don't they have bangs you know like I get it well Amanda this was so great we could talk to you forever and how can people become as, as obsessed with you as we do other than clothes horse what are you up to and how can they follow you if you really want to see what I'm up to you probably go to clothes horse podcast on Instagram you can also learn a lot more about the podcast a lot of the other projects I work on at clotheshorsepodcast.com what else do I do? I teach a series of small business classes called Small Biz Big Pick, which you can also find on Instagram. We're in the middle of a session right now, but we'll be doing signups again in February, maybe January. But I am really committed to helping small businesses grow because I really do believe that that is the future. So I take all of the amazing business tricks that I have learned through you know, a pretty lengthy career in fast fashion and show you how to use that in your small business in an ethical, sustainable way. Incredible. You are a prolific creator. You know what? Like I moved to Austin in January. I have zero friends here because I'm all <laughs> But it also, you know, the energy behind what you do, you can feel it, that you really love it and care and that passion comes through. And I think you 
said this on the podcast recently. People feel that immediately, whatever your business is, they feel the energy behind it. Yeah, totally. In everything you do. And I think also, especially on your IG, your graphics, your writing, the humor, you do such a good job at weaving everything in together. I thought I told you that you couldn't be too nice to me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, we forgot. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. This was so lovely. We will link everything and people are just going to become fans just like us. I hope so. Definitely. I had such a good time talking to the two of you that I would love to do it again sometime. <gasps> yes, definitely part two. Okay. So we have a winner from last week or maybe two weeks ago. Thank you so much, Sam Z for <laughs> your epic review. Sam says my new fave podcast love the balance of fun and informative it's such a pleasure to listen to, <laughs> to listen to michelle and wallace banter and chit chat about the bonkers great word kind of cool and complicated wellness trends of today feels like a few gal pals singing sweet songs in my airpods love it love it that you got wallace's name spelled correctly Oof. Points. 10 points, <laughs> 10 points <laughs> to you. And congratulations on winning the Moon Juice Acid Potion. It truly is the best acid potion of all time. I miss it so much. I can't wait to slather it all over my face probably next week. So we're going to send that to you. Make sure that you drop in to Good For You Pod on Instagram. Send us a DM with your address and reminding us what you won. And we'll get that over to you ASAP. Thank you, Sam. And this week we are giving away... A baby. <laughs> We're giving away a, a child, <laughs> a brand, brand new baby. <laughs> the, the sacrifice of the good for you pot. <laughs> no, JK, we're not doing that. <laughs> so this week we are giving away a book that we want to read and will read probably maybe this week, next week. <laughs> and this book is called Aesthetica. It's by Ali Rowbottom cool last name. And this is something we have been, it's been haunting our cards. We would love to have her on the podcast. And we also can't wait to read this novel. Yeah. It's about an influencer who has gotten plastic surgery and cosmetic procedures and is getting this ultimate procedure to get her face back to its original form. Mm -hmm. And we've learned about it through, via our friend, Jessica DeFino's newsletter, The Unpublishable. And I think it's complicated. It's like a complicated book mm -hmm. and talks a lot about the things that we talk about on this podcast. So I'm excited to read it. Yes. So all you have to do to win this book and we will ship it right to you is submit a review on Apple Podcasts, please five stars only. And we will pick a winner next week and send you the book. And then this can be a little like good for you book club. Yeah. So we hope that you submit. And if you have already reviewed the podcast or you're like, I don't really want to read, that's okay too. You know, it really helps us when you share the podcast with your friends, when you share it on your stories. Thanks for everyone who does that. It helps more, more wonderful ghouls find us and spreads the love. We love making this for you for free. And we love sharing all of our good for you haunted carts and learning about yours. So thanks for helping us make this podcast and, and grow it. We, we love you. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great summer. Don't change. Or do. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Good For You is produced by yours truly, Wallace Miller Blanchard. Our theme song is by Parallel Dance Ensemble. And our wonderful editing is done by Softer Sound Studio. You can find more information about at the link in our show notes.